there and welcome to my yard. It could just as easily be your yard or anybody's yard that's due for a new lease on life. In the first episode of this five-part series, we began giving it a water-wise makeover to give it a new look and new life and find out how to use less water at the same time. And as you can see, we've made some progress. The trees are gone, we've started work on a raised garden bed, and the deck is underway. Today, we're going to find out what's been missing from this soil and how to remedy it. We're going to find out how to irrigate the space most efficiently, and we're going to take a quick peek into the future of our yard and see what that may hold. Not so long ago, we thought the only ones who needed to be concerned about conserving water were the folks who lived in desert areas or places where drought was common. That's why xeriscaping, or dryland gardening, made a lot of sense, especially in prairie centers like Regina, Saskatchewan, where this TV series got its start. Today, however, especially with changing weather patterns worldwide, we're beginning to realize that even traditionally rainy parts of the country may have at least occasional droughts that will cause water shortages. In other places, we're pumping out more groundwater than can be replaced by rainfall and runoff. In rejuvenating our yard, we're trying to follow the seven principles of xeriscaping. You can jot them down as we go through the process in each episode of our TV show, or check them out in our handy workbook. If you'd like to order a workbook of your own, I'll give details and our address at the end of the show. We started the makeover process by planning what we wanted to use our yard for, how much we could afford to spend on the project spread over how many years, what features we liked in other people's gardens, and what we felt we could do ourselves or preferred to have someone else do for us. I checked with the city to see what bylaws might apply to construction or landscaping on our property. In our case, we needed a building permit to construct the deck, so we got that. I went to the library and walked through our neighborhood for ideas, and then took all our bits and pieces to a landscape architect who created a design that we and our contractor could follow. We showed in detail how all that planning and designing was done in episode one of this series. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at Xeriscape principles two and three, soil improvement and efficient irrigation. And we will also show you six ways to reduce the need for water in your garden, and six ways to minimize water waste. But first, let's take a quick look at how we can harvest the free water almost all of us get in the course of a year and use it to give our yards the moisture it needs without costing us a penny or close to it. Even in the driest parts of the country, we get some natural moisture in the form of rain, snowfall, mist, or fog. Harvesting that natural moisture can do a lot to reduce the need for extra watering, and that can reduce your water bill. You can make the most of nature's bounty in a lot of ways. Whenever possible, slope hard surfaces like driveways and walks toward grass or planting areas that appreciate water. So the runoff will go there rather than into the street. Natural moisture can also be conserved in ponds or cisterns in the same way. On steep slopes, create terraces to interrupt and catch the flow of rain or meltwater. Put a catch basin or a series of gravel catchment pits at the bottom of the slope to hold the runoff. Extend your existing downspouts into the ground, sloping at least six to eight feet away from the building, ending in slotted drainage pipes under your lawn or a planting bed, so the runoff can soak into the soil gradually where it's needed. As an above ground alternative under downspouts, use cobblestones over plastic liner instead of concrete blocks to guide the water away from the house so it can run into your lawn or the mulch of your planting beds. And in wintertime, in snowy areas, consider using wind breaks so snow will pile up on the downwind side. As the snow melts, it may provide enough moisture to eliminate any need for irrigation the following spring. Whenever natural moisture is there for the taking, it's just common sense to make the most of it. A 1,000 square foot or 93 square meter roof will generate 150 gallons or 682 liters of water during a quarter inch or six millimeter rainfall. You can harvest this gift of natural moisture at little or no cost. Soil improvement is probably the most important of the seven xeriscaping principles. 
by amending the soil with organic material, you increase its ability to hold water. That in turn improves the workability of the soil and most importantly, it reduces the number of times you're gonna to have to water your plants. I'm talking this morning to Les Henry. Good morning, Les. Hi, Dale. Les is a soil scientist with the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Now, Les, your first bit of advice to me was to take soil samples from various areas in the yard, mix them together and bring them in for testing. Now that's been done and this is one of the samples and could you tell me please exactly what it was you did to that? Well, Dale, if we think of it just as you taking a visit to a doctor, uh, we'll take it through the lab, what would happen? The first thing a doctor would do is a physical examination. So in the lab here, the first thing is done is a physical examination of the soil to determine is this a very sandy soil? Is it a medium textured loamy kind of soil? Or is it a really heavy clay soil? After the physical exam, then they would take the soil pH. As a doctor takes your temperature, it's just a background piece of information. The soil pH tells us something about the overall chemical functioning of that soil. Then the next thing a doctor would do is take your blood pressure. So the next thing we would do is measure the total amount of salts that are present in the soil to find out is there too many salts, is this going to be a problem. So these are just background routine tests that are done on all soil samples. Next step a doctor would do is take a sample of your blood and do some chemical analysis. And we will do chemical analysis of various extracts of the soil to determine how much uh, available nutrients are present and particularly the main ones are the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, and the sulfur. So those are the basic tests that are done on all soil samples that come in for a routine test for a garden or a farm type of analysis. So they're all treated basically the same way then? Yes, all samples would come through unless there was some special problem that had to be dealt with. Now, can you tell me, what did you find out about that pound of ground that I brought in? Well, in, in what you brought in, we found out that this was a, uh, a clay soil. And a clay soil in terms of uh, xeriscaping is good because it holds lots of water. And that's good for xeriscape because that's the main thing that you want to, so you don't have to be running out and watering every other day. But the downside is that a clay soil be, can, can be rather difficult to manipulate in, in a garden type setting. So you might want to add some uh, humus or organic matter. And usually the most convenient way to that to do that is with peat moss. As far as the nutrients, it's well supplied with all nutrients except perhaps some nitrogen and phosphorus. So you may have to add some nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers. So those are the kind of things we found on your particular soil sample. So I'm basically got, uh, it, it's a clay soil that I've got. And what would, what would the process be if that had turned out to be a sandy soil sample? What would you advise me then? Well, th there's various definitions of sandy soil. If it were a sandy soil, probably the same thing as the clay soil. You would add some humus which would increase its moisture holding capacity. A sandy soil will be easy to work with, it doesn't hold much water. If it were really just a sand pile like beach sand, then th there comes a point at which you really can't fix up something bad and you have to do something totally new. So if it were just a straight sand pile, you might have to uh, bring in some new uh, loam or medium textured topsoil to put on top of it. But if it's a soil that's just a little on the sandy side, peat moss will increase the moisture holding capacity and perhaps make it suitable for a xeriscaping type of application. Now, is there any general advice that you can give people who want to convert their yards into a xeriscaped landscape? What would you tell them basically to do with their soil? Well, probably the first thing they need to do is, is know what have I really got. And there's many sources of information. They can bring a sample into a soil testing lab as you've done here. And soil testing labs themselves are good sources of information because they have professional people and that's their business. There's also provincial departments of agriculture, university departments of horticulture and soil science, uh, federal research stations. There's usually a variety of sources, city, uh, uh, municipal types of uh, horticulture departments are usually good sources of information to help you figure out what have you exactly got. And then when you know what you've got, you can start uh, determining what kind of program you can take, whether you're going to have to make an amendment or whether maybe you've got a situation where you'd be better off to bring in some new topsoil to start working with. So there's lots of information out there that people can access. Yes, there is. Les, I want to thank you very much for the soil testing, the analysis and the information. It's going to be a thank great you. help in this project. Thank you. Thank you. One inch of water will penetrate 12 inches or 30 centimeters in sand and 6 to 12 inches or 15 to 30 centimeters in loam but only 4 to 5 inches or 10 to 13 centimeters in clay soil. That means the water will penetrate sandy soil very quickly, but it will also dry out quickly too, so you'll have to water more often. Clay takes longer to water, but it holds the moisture longer too. It's important to remember that xeriscaping is not a quick fix. You'll see some benefits early on in the process, but the biggest payoffs will come further down the road. 
And that's why it always pays to keep the future in mind when you're planning for today. A family's situations and needs will change. Children will outgrow a playground, leisure time may increase, and health concerns may affect how we approach activities. As the seasons pass, trees and shrubs will grow and develop, perhaps beyond your expectations. Pruning will help sometimes, but not always. Root systems will change as plants mature, and irrigation methods will have to change along with them. Landscape professionals and experienced gardeners can do a pretty accurate job of estimating what a mature yard will look like. So before you make that final decision on what to plant and where to plant, it's a good idea to talk to the experts and find out just exactly what the future may hold. Computer programs are being developed for somebody like me to give me a better look at what's likely to happen in three years or five or ten. At the very least, we can probably save ourselves a few unpleasant surprises by taking a future look at just how tall and wide our trees, shrubs, and plants will become, how deeply and broadly the root systems will spread, and what the blossoms, fruit, and leaves will do to the property and your neighbors, and whether we decide to do things high-tech or in the old-fashioned, time-tested way. Now, let's take a look at our next Seriscape principle, effective irrigation starting with some more helpful hints on how to conserve water. It's estimated that about half the water employed for domestic use in this country ends up on somebody's lawn or garden. About half of that amount is considered to be applied unnecessarily or wasted. We've already talked about one of the ways you can become water-wise, and that's by harvesting free moisture as rainfall or snow. Here are six more. Six ways you can reduce the amount of moisture your garden actually needs. Choose drought-tolerant plants, as many as possible that will do well in your region using mostly natural precipitation without a lot of extra watering. Group plants with similar water needs. Put the big water users together where you can water them without waste and the lighter water users further away where irrigation will be minimal or unnecessary. Eliminate weeds. They suck up moisture, so the fewer weeds there are, the more water there'll be for the plants in your garden that really need it. Put mulch over the soil, under and around shrubs, plants, trees, and garden vegetables to reduce moisture loss through evaporation. This can also reduce weed growth and soil erosion and provide color and texture to your landscape. And finally, reconsider your turf. What use do you want to make of your lawn? So how much lawn do you really need? For major reductions in water needs, keep only as much lawn as your household or family activities require. I'm here today with Chris Shannon and we're going to talk irrigation systems. Welcome Chris and thank you very much for dropping by. Well, thanks. Just to give you a bit of background on what is going to happen. We are planning to group plants in low water use areas and high water use areas. Now, what I'm wondering is can you design or recommend a system that will take care of the whole yard? Oh, I think so. Bill? Yep. Yeah. Um, because of the way your yard is shaped up, as you've done with low water usage plants here and high water usage plants there and beds over here, you've sort of segregated the different areas. Now, with uh, micro-irrigation, what we call micro-irrigation, we end up with uh, uh, tools such as these emitters. Here's one type and here's another type. And these are basically uh, a, a drip, 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 drip type of an irrigation. It's a very slow application to a very small area. Okay. Okay. Well, one, one question. Is it possible for someone like me who has had absolutely no experience in this field to design and install my own irrigation system. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, in some ways I almost recommend it because uh, as your needs change or your desires change, you'll be changing your yard around from time to time. Makes sense. And so if you know how your system works, <laughs> of course you'll be that much uh, uh, better equipped to take care of it later on rather than calling in a contractor all the time. Okay, now I do, I do want an automatic system, but here's another question. It may sound like a dumb question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Is an automatic system essential for a zero escaped situation like this? 
Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's it's um, necessary. It's certainly uh, worthwhile in terms of time and efficiency. Okay. Uh, water efficiency uh, in a, in a xeriscape landscape uh, uh, comes by regulated emitters emitting exactly what uh, the plant needs by design, rather than haphazardly uh, uh, watering with a hose or trying to calculate every time you water what you what what the plant needs. And that's what I was wondering. So one of these systems will save me time. It will save me money, and it will save me water. Yeah, and, and your plants will be healthier, healthier as a result. Too. Now, there is a way, I would assume, that a system like this can guarantee a thrifty water delivery directly to the plants? Yes, yes. And that sort of depends on the type of plants that you're growing. For instance, I was just talking about emitters. These are a great little unit. Uh, they're stationary. They stay there and they'll drip uh, the appropriate amount of water um, each time you water for that plant. Now, in the case of an annual uh, bed, for instance, that might not be the best choice simply because you're always digging in there and, and, and changing it year after year. So that something like that, you might want to go to a spray head where it's spraying over top, you know? Right. Uh, in other instances, a spray might not be as well because then, of course, you're covering the foliage all the while. So there are different tools for the different types of watering. And often cases, it's just a matter of segregating uh, the valves or the watering systems for the different plants much the same way you did your plants. So in the long run, Chris, you think I'm on the right track in putting in an irrigation system take care of my Xeriscape yard. I think in the long run you'll appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate the advice very much and thank you for dropping by. No problem at all. The key to efficient irrigation is to know how much water to use, where to apply it, and during which season or time of day it will do the most good. Communities across the continent are taking steps to conserve water through civic conservation programs. These programs encourage individual households to keep water waste to a minimum and recycle captured rainwater for irrigation purposes. Now you might think that a city like Edmonton wouldn't have a problem with water, situated as it is right on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River. But several years ago, Edmonton instituted a program called Ecoscaping, and that's their version of Xeriscaping. The program came into being in response to the fact that during summer, water consumption was sometimes increasing by as much as 50%. And that's a 50% increase in the amount of treated water that was going directly onto lawns and gardens. Like so many communities, Edmonton has published a variety of materials on water conservation. And they've found that once people are aware of the value of water conservation, they will make it part of their regular routine. For example, water early in the day. The hotter the day, the more water evaporates. Some people recommend watering in the evening after sundown, but then the lawn and garden stay wet overnight, and that encourages plant disease. Water deeply and thoroughly. That encourages roots to grow deeper into the soil, so grass and plants are less affected by stresses such as heat, cold, drought, and surface drying. If you water when it's windy, you lose lots of moisture to evaporation. If you have water runoff, especially from your lawn, the problem may be in your soil. In heavy soil, you may need to aerate by punching holes in the lawn to let the water penetrate. Or you may need to remove the buildup of undecayed grass clippings or thatch. Half an inch, one and a quarter centimeters or less is beneficial to your lawn. More than half an inch may repel water. Or you may just have your sprinkler set in the wrong place so the water runs straight into the gutter. Arrange your sprinklers or other type of irrigation system to deliver water to the roots of your plants, not the foliage. Mature trees should be watered at the drip line, the outer limit of the leaves and branches, not at the trunk. If you have an underground sprinkler system, you can upgrade it by installing water-conserving sprinkler heads. In some parts of your yard, drip irrigation devices may deliver just the right amount of moisture directly to the plant's roots. Follow any watering guidelines that may be in place in your district or community. By cooperating in this way, there is more likely to be enough water and pressure for community needs, and expensive overbuilding of the city water system may be avoided. The amount of water your plants need varies with the season and the kind of weather. Water less frequently and for a shorter length of time when the weather is cool and cloudy, and in the cooler months of the year. For hanging baskets and other container plants which dry out quickly, consider using hydrogels or soil polymers 
tiny sponge-like particles which absorb and hold hundreds of times their weight in water and dissolved nutrients. So now we've covered the first three of the seven principles of xeriscaping, planning and design, with a realistic look at the future to see what today's plantings will look like a few years from now, soil improvement and efficient irrigation. In our next show, we'll take a look at how to have your lawn and enjoy it too, and what types of plants to consider for your particular type of garden and regional climate. I hope you'll join us then. I'm Dale Simmons, and it's your yard. If you would like to order your copy of the It's Your Yard workbook and accompanying video, please call 1-800-663-1653.